would you give us like a five or 10 minute ethnobotany 101 and sure. just help orient us in what that is in the first place for the listener's benefit? From the time our species arose, and obviously earlier, we had to figure out how to survive. So the immediate needs are going to be food, shelter, uh, water, medicine. Now, three of those come from plants. So what ethnobotany is, the study of the relationship between plants and peoples. Now, there's a reductionist view, which says ethnobotany is about uh, scientists picking up their plant press, heading into the jungle and working with tribal medicine. Uh, that's definitely part of it, and perhaps the most romantic and interesting and archetypal image. But uh, I think studying a, a farmer in a cornfield in Iowa is ethnobotany, it's people mm -hmm. and it's plants. But the fuse is lit now. The Amazon is being destroyed faster than ever. Tribal cultures are coming in with the, into contact with the outside world faster than ever. And unlike in China and India, where they've been writing down their knowledge of medicinal plants for thousands of years, the indigenous peoples of the Amazon don't have a traditional written language. And so the race is on to save the knowledge and the plants because you, you, you can save one without the other, but obviously it, it's not the same. You can do high throughput screening where you set up a lab and want all the stuff and is it good for diabetes, is it good for cancer, is it good for depression? But isn't it better to look at the table of contents where you're trying to find something in a, in a, in a long and complicated book? And the indigenous people's wisdom is that table of contents and that index. There's very, very, very few compounds uh, that have come from nature that were found in blind screens. One of them was cyclosporin, which is an immunosuppressant used in organ transplant surgery. That was a blind screen. Taxol, uh, an anti-cancer superstar, was found in the Pacific U in a blind screen. But my buddy, Jim Duke, the late Jim Duke, was talking to the local tribes people, and they said, yeah, of course we use that for medicinal plants. Nobody asked us. So uh, we might've got to it sooner. So the point here is that nature is the ultimate source of healing. And I don't just mean alkaloids and plants. I'm talking about spiritually and ethically uh, and clean air and clean water all tied together, but also that the indigenous peoples have to be considered as a part of it, not only to find this stuff, but to steward this stuff, but it has to be done in a way which benefits them and us because in the past that was never the case. Well, and, and uh, latched on to that, would you also speak a little bit about what you're doing currently with the Amazon Conservation Foundation, and then we can dive into specifics? Yeah, I'm an ethnobotanist by training, and I and my partner Liliana Madrigal, a Costa Rican protected area specialist, 25 years ago, set up the Amazon Conservation Team, amazonteam.org, to specifically address what we were calling biocultural conservation. In other words, 25 years ago, 25% of the Amazon was in national parks. 25% uh, of the Amazon was indigenous lands, but nobody was working with the Indians to help them protect their land, their rainforests, their rivers, and their culture. That is what we set out to do. And at this point, a quarter of a century later, we partner with over 100 tribes, uh, mostly Amazonian, but not solely in, in the Amazon. We work with the Kogis, some of the most traditional and spiritual people in, in the world. They live on in Northern Colombia. And one of our key approaches is mapping, ethnographic mapping, where if in, in revolutionary terms, we don't make the maps. We teach our indigenous colleagues how to make the maps. We teach them how to use the GPS. We give them the satellite imagery, but they make the maps. It's the ultimate act of empowerment. It's a perfect mm -hmm. marriage of indigenous shamanic wisdom and 21st century technology. 